Hey there friends, hope you're all doing well. Recorded this whole video yesterday and then realized at the end of it that apparently I hadn't pressed the record button or something because there was no footage recorded on my phone. So we're restarting this whole thing. Now, before we start the video, I do want to remind you guys to wash your hands, stay safe during all these times. But with that out of the way, a couple weeks ago, I made a video specifically about filming on my phone and how I had access to some really high-end gear, but I was choosing not to use it and instead opting for my phone for certain specific reasons. And in that video, I didn't really explain how I was doing what I was doing. And I know that could be super beneficial for a lot of people that are wanting to get into filming, but don't have anything besides their phone. And so in this video, I'd like to go through the step-by-step -step process that I use to film my videos and how you can do it as well and kind of tips and guidelines for filming on your phone. There is now a title on the screen. Now, just in case you haven't watched the other video, I work for a company that does real estate photography and media and we sell a specific course that I do most of the ad work and kind of course videos for. So I edit and produce and film those. And of course we release them to the people that uh, we sell the course to. And because that's literally my full-time job, nine to five, I had a little bit of kind of say in what cameras we got. So I picked out a couple that really suit my needs and are cameras that I like shooting on. And so I have access to them. There's one that's a 6K camera that we use. It's really, really nice. It's very, very expensive. And generally a great camera for the stuff that we do in office. But what I found is filming on that camera wasn't exactly what I was looking for, especially with the videos that I wanted to do at home. First off, the look that that camera gives off is not the look that I want my videos to have. We don't have a really wide lens for it and I don't have the money to go buy one. And so it's a camera that looks really good, but doesn't give off the feel that I was looking for. Another thing is, is that I was pretty much having to leave it up at the office, which means that I was having to film my personal videos after work or before I started, you know, going on the clock. And both of those things made it really difficult for me to actually get the feel in my footage that I was looking for. I was very limited by our pretty, you know, corporate looking office space. Whereas, you know, especially here at the house, you know, I have a much more kind of suitable environment to me and look to my footage that I want, you know, specifically for these videos. And the third thing is, is that setting up a professional cinema camera takes a lot of time. It's something that takes a lot of effort and getting everything perfectly right, especially by myself is very difficult. And so shooting on a cinema camera is difficult for, you know, these personal projects that I'm doing. And it makes it a little bit tougher to kind of sit down or want to sit down and film, which is why shooting on a phone is a lot more simple for me. It's a lot easier. It makes more sense. I always have it with me. It's something that I can set up really, really quickly and kind of gives me no excuse not to film the videos that I want to film or I, you know, should film to stay on my schedule. And most phones nowadays are pretty decently high quality. They've got a good look to them. You know, they're not as good as a professional cinema camera, but for what I'm doing and the kind of projects that I'm wanting to put out on this channel, I don't need that extra kind of quality. And along with that, there are some editing techniques that you can use that I will talk about here in a second that give you the ability to kind of make phone footage look a little bit more like professional footage, especially if you play to the strengths of your phone versus the weaknesses that your phone camera has, then you're going to be getting footage that looks really, really good. And with a little bit of editing can be really passable to where people won't even realize that it was shot on a phone. And this is really important because a lot of us, especially with COVID-19 are trying to save money. We're trying to be a little bit more financially frugal, but that shouldn't stop us from being able to kind of put out the content that we want to make or, or create whatever videos that we want to make or anything like that. It should be something that we have access to. And hopefully with this video, I'll be able to help you kind of in that process, understand it for yourself and be able to learn how to, you know, feel comfortable shooting video, editing video and putting it out online from, you know, just your phone and whatever equipment you have lying around the house. All right. So with that said, let's jump into the tutorial. Step one. This one's a simple one. Grab your phone out of your pocket and open up the camera app. Step two, press record. All right, so hopefully this helped. That's pretty much it for this video. I'm totally joking. Once you've opened your phone up and gone to your default camera app, uh, look at the settings that are in there and see what the resolutions are. Now, I would recommend using the default camera app versus any other kind of third-party camera app like Lightroom's camera or anything like that. The reason is, is that most cameras are applying some AI techniques to your footage already to make it look a little bit better. Uh, like iPhone does this and Samsung and all of the other phones out there are doing it. Whereas third-party apps don't necessarily apply the same AI techniques. So technically they may say that you're getting a higher quality of footage out of their apps. But what I've found is that the default default camera app usually handles most of your footage better than what a third-party app can. So 
with all that being said, that short aside, uh, open up your camera app and go to your settings and look at the default resolution. I would recommend using the highest resolution that's on your camera or that your phone can record in. So if you have 4K, shoot in 4K. If you don't have 4K, then shoot in 1080p or whatever the case may be. And I would recommend shooting in 30 frames a second. Most YouTube videos, most of the stuff on the internet right now is shot in 30 frames a second, especially even on regular cameras. So especially if you record in 30 frames a second, it's going to feel as if you're shooting like everybody else shoots. And so it'll kind of disguise the fact that you're shooting on a phone. So highest resolution at 30 frames a second. If it doesn't give you an option for frames a second, then just choose 1080 or 4K or whatever the highest uh, recording quality uh, that your phone is capable of. From there, you have a few options. Most cameras nowadays have multiple cameras on the phone itself. You have your selfie camera, and of course, sometimes maybe two or three on the back of your camera. All of these are gonna have different uses and different purposes. I would recommend using the One X uh, for most of your filming, if you can. It's usually what phone companies um, invest the most money into because that's what most people use most of the time. You might have an ultra wide and a telephoto and both of those are gonna be good, but the quality of sensors that those cameras have is not gonna be as high as the one that's in your One X camera. And so just keep that in mind. Uh, for me, I do actually use the ultra wide on my phone and you know, I'm okay with the trade off and quality that I get from that. Again, you can kind of make up for some of that in editing afterwards, but I'm just kind of comfortable with the quality loss. I really like the feel that you get from a wide angle lens better than I do the One X. And so that's just kind of why I do it. Now, a good note to make is I would use the cameras on the back of your phone versus the selfie camera. And, and the reason is, is just like the ultra wide and the telephoto, the selfie camera is gonna be a lower resolution, a lower quality, and not gonna look as good. So again, you can use it. If you have to, then go for it. But I would recommend setting up your shot, framing it where you want the shot to be, and then walking in you know, around your phone and filming like that. Step three. Now, when it actually comes to recording, I would recommend playing to your phone's strengths instead of uh, its weaknesses. For instance, phones aren't really good at capturing a lot of detail in bright areas and dark areas at the same time. So it's good to focus on one or the other. I'll take the filter that I have off of this video real quick, but you can kind of see that it's really flat. It doesn't look like there's a lot of contrast in this shot until I kind of add my filters back on. And you can notice from that, everything in this video is kind of at the same kind of brightness level. There's not a lot that's a lot brighter than other parts, which means my camera doesn't have to try to pull details from bright areas and dark areas at the same time. It's kind of all at the same uh, exposure level or brightness level. That's going to really help when it comes to disguising the look of a phone uh, when it comes to shooting video. If you can kind of get everything to be at the same brightness level and not have super bright areas or super dark areas, it ends up looking a lot better and you can go in afterwards with a little bit of contrast, a little bit of editing and make things look a lot more contrasty or bright and dark there versus trying to do that when you actually shot the footage. So for example, maybe you're shooting towards a window and the window is really bright and there's just no detail in it at all. Uh, turn the camera around, shoot away from the window instead, and you'll get the light from the window kind of illuminating everything in the room, and usually that makes things look a lot better and kind of more professional or whatnot. Always make sure that the subject of the frame, whether that's you or the person you're filming or whatever the case may be, is well lit, so that way your camera doesn't have to struggle to get information from kind of what it's taking in from its sensor. Now, I might have rambled on during that section, but basically, as you learn to film a little bit more, you'll realize that, again, your phone's gonna have limitations, that's just how it works. And if you can play to its strengths and kind of minimize the limitations that a phone usually has, the footage will look a lot more professional. It'll look a lot more kind of high quality and it'll be a lot less um, apparent that you're shooting on a phone versus on a actual camera. Once you've done all of that, press record, grab the shots that you want, and then let's move on to step four. Step four. Now, once you've taken your footage, I'd recommend not trying to edit it on your phone. If you have an iPad or a Mac laptop or just a laptop in general, if you game or something like that, you might have a desktop. Transferring your footage onto there and using a higher end editing program will really be what kind of sets your footage apart. Now, this is definitely the most complicated part because uh, learning an editing software does take a little bit of time and it will take a little bit of adjusting, getting used to, but I'd recommend it because like I said, I'll take the filter off again. This is all stuff that I did in editing. And once I apply it again, you'll notice how much better the footage actually looks. Now there's a lot that went into this. Obviously I'm using a light. I have this well lit, but I could have just done this in front of a window. And as long as I got my lighting right and you know, it decently looks okay out of camera, pulling it into an editing program to kind of give it those final touches really kind of disguises that it was shot on the phone. It allows it to look higher quality. And there's a lot of things that an editor on a computer um, allows you to do that an app on your phone really won't 
uh, be able to do. And the nice thing is, is that if you learn how to use an editing software, pretty much all of them are the same out there with a couple quirks to them. So if you learn one, you can always switch over to another later and they all grow with you in the sense that most softwares out there allow you to do a lot of high-end work. So there's a chance that if you just take a little bit of time to work on it now. Later on, when you're wanting to do more complicated stuff, you'll have the ability because you have the program right in front of you that allows you to do that. So now there's a, a ton of different programs out there to use. Uh, the top three right now are kind of Final Cut Pro 10, which is for Mac users, uh, Premiere Pro, which is available on all systems, and DaVinci Resolve 16, which is available for all systems. Now for me, I personally, I use DaVinci Resolve 16. It's what I use for work pretty much eight hours a day. And so it just makes sense to also use that for my personal work. It's a program that not a lot of people used up until a couple years ago, but it's something that Hollywood Studios used a lot, and when it became available to the public, a lot of people started kind of switching over. It's a one-time payment if you buy the studio version, but there is a free version that allows you to do a lot of work and allows you to pretty much use the whole program with a few kind of uh, limitations uh, completely for free. You can download it right now directly off their website. So I definitely recommend that if you're wanting a free option. I paid for the studio option. It's a one-time payment, so if you end up using this program for more than two years, it's kind of worth it compared to all the other subscribers subscription models out there. But yeah, that's my little spiel for DaVinci Resolve 16. That's what I use. There's Premiere Pro, which is very common. There's a lot of people that use that program and I'd highly recommend it if you're just wanting something that's simple, it's really easy to get started with. Premiere Pro has been around for forever and it's something that is based on a subscription model. I think you pay like $10 a month. And so if you're wanting something that's cheap right now, that's a great option. I personally don't like the subscription service anymore. And so I've kind of tried to get away from it, but most people use that one. I definitely recommend that if that's what you're looking for. And then you have Final Cut Pro 10, which for Mac users is kind of just the way to go. Um, it is kind of expensive. You have to buy it all at once, just like uh, DaVinci Resolve 16, but that's a great option too. So all three of the main editors right now are amazing programs. They're really, really great. You just kind of have to pick your poison, what you're willing to pay, because at the end of the day, these programs are really what are gonna make your footage look a lot better. Step five. All right, so now when it comes to actually editing your footage, you know, get it off your phone, put it into a little folder, drop it onto your computer. And what I would mainly focus on here is color and effects. One of the things that's gonna help disguise your footage and make it look a little bit more professional is by adding titles and effects that wouldn't be available on normal phone editing apps. And most programs allow you to do this. Final Cut Pro 10 is really, really good at kind of custom effects that look really, really professional. Mainly what I focus on is color. And again, I'll show what my footage looks like without the filters and stuff that I put on it. And then again, with the filters on, I usually add a little bit of a vignette. I change up some of the way that the colors look and I add some contrast and saturation. Those are gonna be the things that really allow you to kind of customize the look of your footage and make it look whatever way you want. And with in reason, because you'll have the ability to kind of do it yourself and kind of be hands-on with your footage, you won't end up making your footage look like the Instagram filters or the YouTube filters that kind of come default with their systems. Instagram and YouTube and TikTok kind of give you these one size fits all for all footage out of every camera from every phone uh, filters. And those don't really work as well as actually custom going in and changing contrast, saturation, stuff like that. And so I definitely recommend watching tutorials on how to do that stuff for learning that more but basically I would say focus on color, focus on adding some titles or effects, adding some fun transitions or cuts into your footage. And that's one of the main things you can do to kind of distract people from the fact that you shot your footage on a phone. Another tip is to add a little bit of sharpening to kind of make it appear like there's a little bit more detail in the footage. I definitely recommend doing that. I do that on most of my videos too. But yeah, learn an editing program, work with your footage inside of one and add some color and effects that kind of match what you're looking to do in your videos and then just play around with it. Take some time to make some mistakes, just play around with your footage, see what you like, see what you dislike and just go from there while watching YouTuber tutorials and whatnot. Step six. Now this is something that I kind of threw on here at the end because I forgot to mention it earlier, but I definitely recommend getting good audio. So I have a mic that I used to use for live streaming. And if you already live stream or do stuff like that, you're already going to have something like this. Um, I can show you what the audio sounds like out of my phone instead of my, you know, mic here. And you can tell that there's a massive difference between the two. It sounds a lot better if I'm using this versus that. And so I definitely recommend getting like a blue Yeti if you have the chance or maybe a mic that you plug directly into the bottom of your phone. You can find those on Amazon for like 20 to 30 bucks and really anything will sound better than the mics that are in your phone. And so I definitely recommend doing that. Make sure that the mic is close to your mouth. You know, you can really spend as much money or as little money as you want doing that. I'll link some mics below if you want to kind of see what I have on my different systems and how they sound. Step seven. All right, so once you've recorded your audio, you've gotten your footage, you've cut it all up and added it all together, it comes time to export that footage out. I would recommend exporting it out at the highest quality 
quality that you can uh, to whatever program or um, app or website that you're trying to upload it to. So if you shot your footage in 4K, I'd recommend exporting it 4K. If you guys shot it in 1080p, then I recommend uh, exporting it at 1080, but really just go with whatever the highest quality you can get out of your footage is. Now, a good note to make here is that TikTok only allows you to upload 1080p videos. And so if that's the case, make sure that you're shooting in 1080 by 1920 and then exporting that way. Even if you shot in 4K, you'll have to downscale. Uh, but outside of that, you know, upload at the highest resolution that any uh, app or website or, you know, whatever allows you to record at and upload at. Conclusion. So I know that wasn't super detailed. That wasn't super, super specific, but those are some kind of tips and tricks on especially how I do my footage and how I make it look. The process does get complicated when it comes to editing, but that's really what sets your footage apart from all the other stuff out there. Everybody has a phone on them nowadays, which is a great thing, but to make your footage not look like it was shot on a phone, you're gonna have to do a little bit of extra work to kind of get it not looking like you just slapped a regular Instagram filter onto it, but to where it feels like you actually put effort in, you put work in, and that the footage looks good or more professional because you took the extra time to kind of put that extra uh, work and effort in. I don't know if I said that well, but hopefully you get the gist of what I'm trying to say here. The biggest things are, of course, to, you know, play to the strengths of your phone. Make sure that you're not blowing out windows or filming in really dark areas to where the footage looks grainy. Make sure that you're getting good audio, that when you use an editing program that you add some effects in or stuff in that kind of distracts people from the facts that you're using a phone to film. I kind of do punch-ins, I do some titles, and that really, really helps. I guess to wrap all of this up though, at the end of the day, everybody has a phone and you can just press record and it's going to look good. Phones have done a really good job lately of, you know, having good looking photos and videos. And even if you don't take any of these tips, you can take phone footage and it will look good if you put a little, you know, kind of thought into how you want to frame it and stuff like that. But there is a way to make phone footage look professional, look like an actual camera. And to do that, you do have to put a little bit of extra work in, but I would say that it's totally worth it. I have access to amazing equipment and I do use it on a daily basis, but I would prefer shooting on this because the strengths of this are more of what I'm looking for for my videos and help me a lot when it comes to kind of the feel that I'm looking for and kind of the convenience that I'm looking for when it comes to recording YouTube videos. That's pretty much it for this video. Hopefully that helped out a lot. Um, I will link to some more resources below if you guys wanna actually learn a little bit more about editing or kind of working with phone footage and learning how to color grade it or add some special effects or whatever the case may be. All of those things will be linked in the description below. Uh, but with that being said, that's it for this video. Remember to wash your hands and stay safe and I'll see you guys in the next one.